For the past two months, we've been spoiled in a way I don't think we'll be again anytime soon. Succession Barry Sunday was a phenomenon that lasted just long enough for us to be actively aware in the moment that we were experiencing something special, and it inevitably concluded before wearing out its welcome, with grace and dignity intact. It makes sense for the obvious reason that they were paired back to back to talk about them in one video, but I think the two shows from the very start have had similar trajectories. Roughly similar release dates for each season, which means both were split up by COVID between their second and third seasons. I personally think each show's third season was the weakest, which I'll elaborate on, and they both just finished a final run in their fourth seasons that were each some of their respective show's finest work. The show's parallels run deeper than that, but they're also clearly opposites of each other in so many ways, from quantitative metrics like runtime to their fundamental artistic approaches. Succession is an hour and Barry's a half hour. Succession's a drama that's surprisingly funny and Barry's a comedy that's surprisingly dramatic, at least in awards show binary terms, so they cover their bases. But not only is Succession an hour, but in its last few episodes it stretched that limit as far as HBO tends to allow, whereas Barry, which could have very easily bloated itself like so many other alleged half hours are doing, committed firmly to its narrative economy, ironically liberating itself by sticking so rigidly to the half hour. Its longest episode was 36 minutes. And I think this is emblematic of how the two shows' general strengths differ from each other, but complement each other so well nonetheless. Succession's final season more or less hits all the expected marks. Logan dies, we see a struggle to stay afloat without him, a new CEO is crowned while punctuating itself on a heartbreaking note showcasing how broken and isolated from each other these family members are. Maybe some of the timing here was surprising, but these were all undeniable things we knew from the first episode would end up happening. But the execution of these things is so brutally honest and personal, and operating at the height of the unique language the show's crafted for itself, that it doesn't need a bag of tricks to be a compelling last act. Barry, on the other hand, has changed so radically by this point that it almost seems ashamed of the show it used to be. I used to fancy it as a pretty visually uncompelling show that was tightly written and well acted enough to succeed dramatically. And now the writing is all over the place, but it's in service of these artfully minimalistic set pieces that open up the scope of the show into something much more comprehensive and meditative. So every Sunday, whatever spot Succession wouldn't manage to hit, Barry would come in and fill up the gaps. In my head it feels like process printing, where layer by layer they form a fully colored picture. Except with only two layers, and each layer can speak for itself. But in conjunction, they create a night of TV that has rarely been this satiating. And that they kept it up for seven weeks straight is nothing short of a miracle. In general, I think my issues with these third seasons stem from the four-season structure in the first place. I tend to find that most first seasons are among their given show's best material, as they've usually had the most thorough pre-production done without the time constraints of a continuous show in motion, they're more self-contained, and they have to make a case for themselves to be renewed without already having momentum, so they have the most to prove. I actually enjoy watching a show find its footing and abandon the angles that don't have longevity, which is what typically holds people back from loving first seasons. The main exception to this would be sitcoms usually falling flat before they've figured out what works comedically, but even though Barry's a comedy, neither of these shows are sitcoms. And then once the ball is in motion after season one, because TV's a medium that thrives on a perpetual second act, it makes sense that the first season of this middle act, season two, would have the most stamina. And then final seasons are a beast of their own, playing cards that the showrunners have been saving and taking risks that weren't possible in the past with the need to keep the show going in future seasons, as well as the general sense of impending doom that accompanies these things. So between all these factors, it makes sense that third seasons have a tougher time hitting the bar, for me at least. There are exceptions, of course, and I hate to prescribe or make blanket statements about all TV, but this was at least my experience with both Succession and Barry, and part of the reason I feel they've had such similar trajectories. I made a whole video about Succession's third season, which is apparently my most controversial take, but I do think it's my least favorite season. The thing is, the line is so thin and borderline arbitrary, it really doesn't matter. Succession's worst is still some of the best TV out there, so it's not even right to call it a slump, really. Barry, on the other hand, had a slightly wider margin for me between its third season and all the others. I still liked it, and this is something I'm open to revisiting on rewatch, but where the first two seasons fed off of how far they could take Barry without upending the life he made for himself and letting the cat out of the bag, season three is about all 
all of this linearly falling apart without much in the way of self-preservation, so I thought it lacked some of that tension. It's also where Bill Hader started directing more than just a couple episodes, and we see the beginnings of the kind of lightly surreal or minimalistic set pieces he'd perfect in season 4, but I don't think he was quite there yet, despite the pockets of greatness we do get. I know the structure of Barry was outlined pretty early on, but my theory is that where Jesse Armstrong and company saw the period following peak COVID to cement Succession's approach despite all the obstacles, Hayter took that time to rethink what he wanted Barry to be when they'd come back to it on a fundamental level, and season 3 was a necessary process of destruction for the show to be reborn into what it is now. Not all of the strengths this season were unprecedented. The set piece focused framework was present in such episodes as Ronnie Lilly back in season two. Season three began the new meditative language the series has settled into. And although that season lost the duality of Barry's persona as a genuinely pleasant guy, it merged the two personalities and made him truly feral. His deluded attempts at pleasantries being even more disturbing than his mask off assassin instincts, paving the way to who he is this season. When it was announced that this would be the final season, Knowing that Bill Hader sees Barry as a basically unambiguously awful person, I was a little worried because the attempts at humanizing him in the past, despite him doing these irredeemable things, was what made the show so gut-wrenching to watch, like all the tentpole prestige TV models. So even though season 3 was subversive in that regard, I think this contributed to the less queasy feeling I had watching it, and that led me to believe that 4 would just follow the same trajectory until Barry dies in prison, which would of course be a supremely boring direction to take things. Turns out, Barry being unhinged beyond the realm of human emotion at this point was the most refreshing thing they could do with him, no longer inviting us to sympathize with someone we should despise, but rather actively fighting off any attempt at conjuring an inkling of empathy for him. The show now rejects any culpability in our tendency to empathize with these anti-heroes, and instead of manipulating us into doing that, it shows us just how eager we are to do it of our own volition, and actively blocks us from doing so. Like the character, the show is now a rabid dog that lashes out at any attempt to be comforted. I think alienating us like that was a pretty subversive move. And now that this is our relationship with Barry, the show flips that season 3 downward trajectory and everything ironically works out for him. He breaks out of prison with ease, Sally runs away with him, and they start a new life together designated entirely by Barry. Even in his death, he gets Gene Cousineau arrested and is heralded as a hero by the media. His lack of humanity and the artifice of this constructed life coincide with the show descending entirely into the dollhouse this season and that's where Hater's able to really start cooking. It doesn't matter that Fuchs keeps flip-flopping from hating to loving Barry episode after episode, or that Sally snaps out of her psychosis like it's nothing, or that Noho Hank turns on Cristobal out of nowhere. Tracking these character threads has become kind of pointless because the show has formally posited this world as a moral wasteland, which not only contributes to its commentary of the Hollywood system, but goes on to make broader statements about morality and American life in general, along with simply providing excuses to to indulge in these set pieces. Hater has a strong infatuation with simple sound design tricks here, and does everything he can to provide some subjective muffling or panning in every episode, and the results are elevated far beyond the literal mechanics of the sound design. Same goes for the resourcefulness in his simple blocking and camera moves, which I guess has been baked into the show's framework from the very first shot of the very first episode. And to this point, I should give a little backstory of my relationship with this show. The first time I watched the pilot, I was straight out of my first year in film school, and under a certain set of substances that, no matter what I was watching, eliminated any suspension of disbelief. And, you know, temporarily disillusioned to the effects of movie magic, all I saw in this opening shot was someone panning the camera on a tripod to some makeup and set dressing that eliminated the need for an action scene with multiple setups, which would naturally be more difficult to shoot than this easy solution, followed by a teleplay that spent the next 30 minutes hitting all the save the cat structural points that had been drilled into my head for the past year. All I saw were resources themselves, and not so much how they were being used, or how that resourcefulness was actually a strength. And that set a bad taste in my mouth from the get-go that dissuaded me from watching the show for months until eventually I gave it another go with a clear head and ended up watching the entire first two seasons in a day. I couldn't get enough of it. Even though the pilot is very anchored to conventions, I am softly pro-convention. Breaking conventions is how 
innovation occurs and new conventions are set, but I maintain that conventions in any field are cemented for the reason that they mostly just work. Now I find that Barry's minimalism makes its pilot one of the clearest and most deconstructible examples of how to set a strong foundation for a show. And as it moved along, I stopped scrutinizing resources and let myself get swept away by the movie magic, so to speak, even as the show actively warned against it. Fast forward, and the show has maintained that resourcefulness, but it's in such a different context now, fully divorced from convention. These sequences serve to basically deconstruct themselves, from the economical action scenes, to the Andrew Wyeth-esque compositions of tranquil desolation, to the moments of plain, matter-of-fact horror. There's a case to be made that letting these sequences breathe so much is an act of showmanship, or rather, showing off that despite their minimalism, they're actually somewhat overstated. And this has resulted in a consistent Twitter phenomenon that's followed each episode, where someone gets a little too enthusiastic about a shot from that week's episode, and then they get dogpiled on. I do think it's because of how much the show emphasizes these moments, but I also think that above all else, these moments need that room to breathe in order to function in the first place. And I think it's impressive that haters in no rush to get anywhere with them, but still manages to pack a solid handful of these sequences into 30 minutes every episode. And to that point, I also have to commend that this last season really feels like two four-episode seasons, without that feeling like a cop-out to the structural integrity. I don't blame anyone who feels that it is rushed, but I think it was the right move to keep things going at such a brisk pace, and I felt sated by both halves. The first half plays out like an almost Cormac McCarthy-esque series of set pieces, whose playful cruelty offers a deeply nihilistic answer to the show's questions about life. Hater achieves a very oblique rhythm here, and even though the core of this stuff is so spiritually void, I think there's still an inkling of light to it all. The sheer playfulness of this sandbox, bits like Fred Armisen as a failed podcasting assassin, or Rain Man being an awakening for Fuchs, demonstrates that despite the pessimism at play, they're still able to have some fun with it. And in stark contrast to this first half, which plays out like a rapid fire One Last Ride album, the season then opens up into a ruminating reflection of Americana, the alcoholism and evangelism behind it all. The fact that the narrative commits to the time skip and Barry and Sally's move as a more or less literal event, but still maintains the abstract flourishes of season three's dream sequences, is an impressive step up in dramatizing the show's themes. It's a completely different show than the one it started out as, but I think this direction stays true to its original themes and actualizes them on a much more powerful level than it would have been preserving the scope of the early seasons and containing everything to Hollywood and showbiz. The show has always been about acting and lying to ourselves and allowing media to justify our actions. Media is not just the film and theater industries, like this show is so far used as shorthand, but now sports are media, history is media, even religion is media, implicitly suggesting that God was our first parasocial relationship. And on top of of that, this sort of faux witness protection thing is the ultimate act, the ultimate performance for Barry and Sally to commit to. This whole new world of theirs is entirely a construction of Barry's, a lie he's telling himself that, seen to its proper conclusion, culminates in being unknowable to his son, other than as a facsimile of a facsimile, or a piece of hagiography no different from the Lincoln biographies Barry became obsessed with. The finale in general is nothing out of left field, operating at the same breakneck pace everything else has been moving. At. But the way it concludes our relationship with media, artificial renderings of people being the closest thing we have to connect with them, and by that logic only being able to connect with our idea of another person, is a potent fear that appropriately punctuates what the show has always been getting at. And despite the bleakness of all the ideas here, the show never falters from its satirical angle. I maintain that it's been funny all the way through. Just as a depressingly lonely comedy. This final spoof doesn't just double down on the comedic framework, but it also takes all the thematic material the show expanded on this season and reinfuses it back into Hollywood, making this final beat a cohesive ending to a cohesive show. Good evening, everyone. My last succession video was largely about how the show rejects the ethos of new sincerity in favor of digging into the weeds of ironic detachment and yielding something more deeply human than any new sincerity entries. So it made sense to pair Barry's final season, which burrowed deeply into postmodern artifice to great success, with this show getting as leveled and humanistic as it probably gets. The one inevitability of this season was Logan's death. It's in the name of the show, there is no position to succeed if the person who's in it survives. But that didn't stop his death in the way it unfolded from being one of the biggest surprises in the whole show. Connor's Wedding is an amazing episode by pretty much 
every metric. Everyone is on top of their game, grieving in real time, playing off of each other through the communal experience of a familial death, and the way the camera doesn't let off of them, pretty much through the whole ordeal, showcases just how gutting the experience is, not to mention how it serves as an emotional foundation for them that'll inform their decision making for the rest of the season. But I honestly view that episode as more of a gateway for everything that follows, and the aftermath that takes up the rest of the season might be my favorite run of episodes in the whole show. Like Barry, this gives the season a strong sense of before and after, not as evenly split into halves, but all the better for occurring so early into the season. The first two episodes are naturally mainly setting up the narrative pins, putting the ball in motion, and providing relatively little in the way of emotional payoff, though certainly not nothing. But with the knowledge of what episode 3 actually is, these first two episodes are not only setting up important plot foundations, but giving us a false sense of stasis regarding what this this season as a whole will even be. Frankly, I was worried we were back in the wonky territory I felt at the weakest moments of season 3, but after Connor's wedding, and I guess technically including Connor's wedding, we're immediately jump-started into some of the longest-running, most consistently phenomenal back-to-back -back episodes this show has mustered. For one thing, in the absence of Logan, this show has opened up so many great aspects it had been keeping from us on the back burner. Aside from basically Jerry, the old guard has primarily been the butt of every joke on this show, which makes sense as they've had to appease the kids, but with Logan out of the picture, they finally open up into fully fleshed, and more importantly, self-assured characters. Watching Carl blossom from this in season 2 to this was one of the the most unexpected joys for me. Hanging in the window like Peking duck. Jess gets a lot of late game play, becoming an 11th hour moral compass to the show, and Matson slots in perfectly, with a whole world of his own that we're given just enough of to imagine a bigger picture. From the unsettling presence of his vaping sidekick to the morsels of information we get regarding his relationship with Ebba. And in this new ground, the season oscillates between new highs and new lows and how fun it is to watch these people and deeply empathize with them, and also how terrible they've always been. The whiplash of going from Stan Twitter baby girl in one episode to fascist enabler in the next, and as always, doing it for their own personal gain, more out of childish pettiness than any strong fundamental desires. So because we had so much chicken when we were kids, I have to like the fascist? Yeah. And yet still being the vessel for such a brutally universal demonstration of coping with death. This is the classic prestige TV push and pull that Barry now seems to be trying to reject, and it's what this show has always been especially great at. Flip-flopping between Maybe the poison drips through. And My God, I hope it's in me. Not inconsistent as a piece of writing, but a piece of writing that comprehensively explores these characters' inconsistencies and contradictions. And this moment in particular is not just about Kendall's contradictions, but how all three testimonies about Logan can be so different from each other, but also all true. Not that the show had really gone anywhere, but Kendall telling Hugo Unless you want me to pull out the strap on was a major we're back moment for me, particularly because of how triumphant it feels while still being a fundamentally evil display of corruption. And that sensation bleeds into all of the manic stamina of this season. The show once again becomes a travelogue with the Norway episode, which say what you will about the show using this mode to let people vicariously live these lavish lifestyles under the thin veil of satire, is at least as much a commentary of ruling class living as it is pure indulgence. But towing that line is where the show gets its energy, and gets us to so frequently level with these terrible people. It's the same paradoxical way that Tom and Shiv berating each other, kicking and biting and calling each other barnacle meat, is really a mating ritual. The same way every sentence uttered in this show is at once a fundamental personal blow and a cry for help. It's the kind of season where each episode is miraculously better than the last. From this international web of intrigue to an almost self-contained Hollywood satire in which Kendall and Roman play the part of their father and Kendall gives somehow his most nauseating performance yet. Gee, I, I feel like I feel like this show would pair really well with Barry, I don't know. Tom and Shiv finally airing out everything they've been dancing around, a systematic but calculated failure resulting in the election of a fascist stemming from childhood feuds and the complacency of every party, and a funeral with no bells and whistles but delivers on every heartbreaking front you can imagine. Triumph and devastation core human truths firing off at a rate almost too rapid to keep up with. So this second win, so to speak, was only really possible with Logan out of the picture, but the specific way they handle his death is also great for so many other reasons. For one, the season 3 finale was sort of a final parental sin, and diverging from another season of navigating the kids' active relationships with Logan preserves the finality of that betrayal. The season primarily being about the active fight for the spot now that it's open makes so much more sense than relegating it to the last couple 
couple episodes. And most importantly, having the death happen off screen with no grand final statement or moment or even coverage for Logan is just true to the nature of death in general. With few exceptions, death is mainly felt in the absence of someone, rather than the active experience of them dying. This is a notion that TV is deeply afraid of, and that Succession seems to tackle head on. The convention we're used to, in which TV shows are so often hell-bent on moments, paying off certain actors' long-term contributions by way of a grand death scene, is one of the ultimate displays of the medium's disconnect from reality. Worse is when a character dies and then they're kept in the show in the form of hallucinations or flashbacks, which condition us to feel that the character isn't really dead. We're still seeing them in some form week to week, and I think it's a trope that's actually damaging to our coping abilities as people, to our object permanence and acceptance of death. If we don't explicitly see a character die, then that's usually almost a guarantee that they're still alive. So Succession, in withholding a grand death for Logan, or any explicit confirmation that he's dead, is healthy for us to experience. We don't know he's gone. And his unceremonious death was powerful enough on its own, but the only other times we see him afterward, which when the Living Plus episode started, I thought initially was veering into that awful trope, are actually, one, a commentary on AI and trying to connect with the dead through virtual resurrection, in the context of Hollywood, and purposed into an advertisement for a product that turns literal human lives into content, and two, an intangible home video the kids will never be able to interact with of their father behaving in a way he never would around them, making this side of him that they've always craved even more intangible. It utilizes its own medium and the conventions associated with it to put us through the same psychological whiplash as its characters. Its rejection of these conventions in the name of humanistic drama already makes it enough of a foil to the decided artifice of Barry, but the fact that these two wildly different approaches are revolving around the same subject matter makes them a perfect pairing. The kids cling to these icons of their dad, pieces of furniture, a document, a video, in the same way Hank clings to the artificial rendering of Cristobal, a collection of matter that resembles the person but can never actually be him. They try to piece their dad together and try to understand him more through ghostly videos, just as Barry's son tries to connect with him through the movie. But both efforts are futile in a world where life is content. One show accepts the tragedy and shows it to us in full force, and one burrows into a false constructed hope. But they're just using different tools to paint the same picture. Now what takes succession from a great show like Barry and elevates it to an all-timer is the sheer caliber of individual moments with all these roots or electrical currents that generate so many different readings of characters' emotions or motivations. Moments happening uninflected within a busy frame, like Jerry sitting at the table with Logan's former lovers, only really decipherable through the show's visual language. Or single throwaway lines which are put in context with past lines and moments without calling explicit attention to them, amounting to this vast emotional network that would be a fool's errand to try and articulate in full. Honestly, I feel like that sort of thing is what Reddit posts and fan cams are best suited for, unarchiving and calling attention to the micro when the show can only present these things as a whole. And because of these current it feels a lot more gratifying to track the arcs of these characters than with Barry. Because the architecture of it all, how they all play into each other and arrive at individually appropriate destinations at the same time and as a result of each other, is just an unfathomable combo of mathematics and human understanding. Kendall expectedly winds up with nothing, not even the CEO position at the cost of all his human relationships. He spends those relationships, and then isn't even able to cash out on it. As soon as the prospect of CEO falls into his lap, he and Roman fuck Shiv over and abandon the trust they built in the aftermath of Logan's death. But worse than that, Kendall backtracks on the waiter story, which is what brought them all together in the first place. And he doesn't just backtrack on it, but he does so in a way where even if he were able to double back down on what actually happened, there's no way they'll ever be able to trust his word on it again. This, to me, is the ultimate tragedy of the show's fixation with empty language. Words that mean nothing. Complicated airflow. Which then, of course, plays into the through line of media and human unknowability and the fruitless means by which we try to understand each other. And becomes the only fitting damnation for someone who flew too close to the sun, especially within a media conglomerate. I fully believe that Shiv's final decision was more out of spite than a desire to save Kendall from the cycles of abuse. Flailing to find a legitimate 
reason and accidentally backing Kendall into this ultimate blunder. In either scenario, she would only be ancillary to the CEO, but in this outcome, she can box her siblings out and preserve the hollow veneer of her own family. And if anything, her decision keeps those cycles as alive as ever. Again, we get an empty embrace between two characters who will never be able to truly connect with each other again, and to put it plainly, she and Tom are gonna raise the most fucked up kid you can imagine. The Shiv diagram stayed true to the end, but considering the position Kendall and Roman put her in, I don't really blame her for doing what she did. Not that she's not just as culpable as Kendall and Roman, but in a game where everyone's acting out of petty self-interest, her primordial sin was just buying in in the first place. It's easy to see how Tom's stature and behaviors and relationship with Shiv, who has arguably become her mother, would translate to the conclusion that Tom has become Logan. But even as the titular successor, he can only ever be a soy cuck beta version of him, serving as Matson's meat puppet rather than the actual leader of Waystar. The writing was on the wall for him becoming CEO, and even if I weren't partial as an official member of Team Tom, I think it was the best outcome dramatically, but I admire that even giving him the the keys to the kingdom, the show can't properly call this a victory for him. And all this talk about these human relationships serving to literalize themes about media, and especially in a season that begins to tackle AI, I feel comfortable calling Greg the ultimate human manifestation of AI. He is chappy. All he can do is take in information and figure out appropriate situations to regurgitate it, unable to think for himself from the moment his mom instructs him to go to New York. And while he was a deeply uncomfortable but mostly innocent character at the start, it makes sense that as a blank canvas of a person surrounded by these people, the only destination for him is corruption and personal ruin. The pain sponge is pain sponge. In fact, I hardly consider him a character, but rather a cup of paint water, whose sole purpose is to reflect everyone's personalities in aggregate as they dip their brushes in him. And like paint water, the combination of these colors is dark, toxic sludge. I feel like Roman is the only character who's actually better off from this decision. Even though he's the most broken of the three, unlike Shiv he gets a clean break from Waystar, and unlike Kendall, I think deep down he knew it was never gonna be him, so he's not entirely upended. At the very least, his world wasn't founded on that notion, and he's had more time to come to terms with it not being him. His Achilles heel was just his devotion to Logan, which would have only been exacerbated by committing himself to the company for the rest of his life. And based on the beat they end him on, I think he's the only one who has any sort of hope. So nothing exactly out of the blue with this finale, but Succession has always been a show that simply needed to land the plane. And they've done that and then some. The final peak and trough of Meal Fit for a King followed immediately by a rift that's probably for life is a lot to recover from. Ranking the seasons is kind of pointless, I think they all have their utility, but even though season 2 has a special place in my heart, this one is a Hall of Famer. I'd also call season 2 a Hall of Famer, but as far as final seasons go, this has to be up there. There's something so fitting about these two shows, which have taken on so much of HBO's identity over the last few years, ending the same week HBO Max shifted to Max. Obviously, this is the consequence of a merger of media conglomerates like we've been watching unfold on Succession, as well as the embodiment of the soulless, metric-driven, algorithmic landscape Barry's always confronted. But it's also a tentpole moment in the streaming, prestige TV era's return to cable package models. And while I'm hesitant to get too alarmist about the state of TV, it at least feels like the end of an era. That it also coincides with the writer's strike, and the opportunity studios have taken to increase AI usage is no accident, but it makes the two shows commentary on media and artificial connection that much more resonant, especially paired back to back as they have been. And ironically, it's been through watching these shows that I've felt more connected than ever to everyone online who's been watching the same thing, like a double negative of media artifice. I know it's easy to feel like these shows are bigger than they are until you look at their viewership compared to more traditional network TV shows, but the combination of subject matter, delivery, and timing has made Succession Barry Sunday one of the more important artistic and communal experiences I've had recently, and I think that speaks a lot more than sheer metrics. For the time being, I'll finally be able to catch up on the shows I've put to the wayside. I'll watch The Idol when it comes out, which only really began to intrigue me when I saw just how lambasted it was. But I will keep Succession Barry Sunday near and dear to my heart, and I hope you all do the same. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.